स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वूपिणे अवतारवरिष्ठा रामकृष्णा ते नम जननी शारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मे तयोश्वा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुहु नम श्रीयतिराजाय विवेकानंद सूर सच्चिदुखस्वूपाय स्वामीनेतापहारिणे Good morning. Today we have a special subject. It's called the way of love. In fact, today and the next Sunday I'm going to speak on this theme on bhakti, on the way of love. And you might think that is a, that's different. Doesn't sound like you. I have actually spoken earlier about the love of God and you will say Swami what's different because you have spoken about this earlier if you remember I have said that the love of God is a very great help in the path of knowledge when you're trying to discover the true self it's very helpful to have a devotional attitude to God but today the love I'm going to speak about is not as a support to jnana not as something which is second fiddle to jnana to the path of knowledge devotion to devotion is helpful in karma when you do your duty in life if you do it out of love that if you do it as a worship of god that's the attitude in which we do karma yoga so bhakti is also a part of karma yoga when you do work you do it with love of god but today i'm not going to speak about bhakti or love as a support to karma yoga as something that is second fiddle to karma no today we are going to speak about love the path of love bhakti yoga as pure bhakti as prema independent in and of itself you see the whole thing about spiritual life is the different paths look at it in different ways in the path of knowledge the problem is that we are ignorant of our nature as god and so the solution to ignorance is always knowledge so if you are ignorant of the of our nature as brahman the solution should be knowledge in the path of meditation raja yoga they will say the problem is the restlessness of the mind it's not ignorance it's restlessness of the mind so the solution to restlessness of the mind is meditation dhyana so vikshepa is the problem and dhyana is the solution meditation is the solution but in the path of love in the path of love they say the problem is not that we are ignorant not that we have a restless mind oh no let your mind be restless for god good enough <laughs> so the path in the path of love the problem is not that we are ignorant if we have we have ignorance about our true nature or that we our mind is restless no the problem is we do not have love for god we do not have shraddha faith in god we do not surrender to the lord that is the problem in the path of love so today and again next week we shall speak about love and only love the question is why the why is the answer to the question why is the same in all paths because there is suffering in life because there is lack of satisfaction in life therefore we speak a spiritual uh, seek a spiritual solution but that's true of the path of knowledge that's true of the path of meditation that's true of every path misery in the world and we try to get true happiness lasting happiness and peace through spirituality but what's special about the path of love the path of love is this in all paths because of suffering we look look for a way out of suffering true peace and happiness through spirituality but what is and that's true of bhakti also but what's special about bhakti is that lord that god loves bhakti more than the one who's practicing the way of knowledge more than the one who's practicing the way of meditation or any other way god loves you in turn the devotee loves god and god loves the devotee in turn there is a speciality about the path of bhakti lord loves bhakti um sri ramakrishna used to give a very homely example when you feed the cow in the cow shed with hay 
if you mix it with a little bit of oil cake or something, a little something tasty, the cow munches it up. So all our spiritual practices, if it is mixed with love, the Lord takes it, accepts it immediately. The Lord loves that. That's the speciality of bhakti. You see, in the path of knowledge, there is this big question about qualifications. If you enter the path of knowledge, they will say, Sadhan Chatushtaya Sampanna Pramata Adhikari, which means, which is as, as uh, difficult as it sounds, which, which means the person with fourfold qualifications is uh, qualified for Vedanta. What are the fourfold qualifications? One, that the discrimination between the real and the unreal, Viveka, Vairagya, the dispassion for the unreal and uh, an intense desire to reach the real. And the sixfold treasures, calmness of the mind, control of the sense organs, uh, withdrawal from the world, a settledness, samadhana, settledness in, inside in Brahman, uh, and then um, fortitude, spiritual fortitude, putting up with all the difficulties in the world in the pursuit of spiritual knowledge, uh, deep faith in the teachings of the, of the Vedanta, of the Guru, and so on. And mumukshutvam, intense desire to be free. Now, how many of us have got those things? How many of us have got those qualifications? But in bhakti, what is the qualification? Nothing. Nothing. Anybody can start. In the path of bhakti, anybody can enter the path of bhakti. Anybody can start. The difference is like this. Knowledge, jnana is like a king. You need to decorate your house. You need to clean up. The, before you invite the king to your house, you need to clean up the house, you need to you know, decorate it nicely and get a, probably order a new sofa set or something because the king is coming. And um, you know, perfume and spray and, uh, and dress up nicely. Everything should be perfect before the king will even deign to come in. And when the king comes in there, the king doesn't do anything, just goes and sits down dryly because he's the king. He goes down and sits down on the throne, couch potato. So, <laughs> but on the other hand, bhakti, the, the uh, word bhakti, the Sanskrit word is feminine. So um, it's compared to a humble maidservant, a maidservant who doesn't want any preparation. You, you can just, she just says, let me into your house, a house, let me into your heart. That's all I want. And once you let her in bhakti, what she does is she comes and cleans up your house. You don't have to do anything. She cleans it up. Bhakti brings in its train all the good qualities, all the virtues. So love of God comes and cleans up your house, decorates your house. So, um, so that is the advantage of bhakti. Anybody, anybody is qualified to love God. You see, there is this uh, problem, you know, in the path of knowledge, Suppose a person who is very knowledgeable in the Vedanta, but still has a hot temper, angry. Now, who wants a jnani who is angry, grumbling all the time and complaining all the time? Who wants a jnani, a person of knowledge, who is envious or critical of others? Who wants a jnani who, is, who, is, uh, who has got so many problems in life, a jnani who is crying? You know, in Hindi they said, Rote vye gyani, gyani kisko pasand hai? Who loves a jnani who, who, is, uh, uh, who has got suffering in the world. Now, the, in the path of knowledge, they will, uh, there's an excuse, there's a cop out. They will say, yes, it's at the level of the body and mind. It's at the level of the mind that these problems are there, but I am the witness self. Yes, sometimes there may be anger in my mind. Sometimes there may be jealousy in my mind. Sometimes there may be greed in my mind, but just because of past conditioning, but I am the witness self. I know this. I have realized it. Not a very attractive thing. From, from, a very, from a distance, you would like, you know, in the Hindi they say, Dur se pratham. you bow down from a distance. We don't want that kind of... No, it, nobody is attracted to that. Why is this problem there? In the path of knowledge, you see, if someone enters the path of knowledge without the requisite qualifications, what happens is, after some time we cultivate this, one begins to get a kind of understanding, a kind of uh, insight into the real, our real nature. But our nature, our 
mind, our subconscious mind has not been purified. It has not yet changed. So it's still the same. So the result will be a lot of understanding about Vedanta maybe. Really some genuine understanding about Vedanta may be there. But in day-to-day -day life, the person is just the same. There is no difference. Whereas what Bhakti does is different. You see, the, the difference is this. The problem is that the desires of the heart, desires which pull us to the world, they are of the nature of I want. Desire is always of the nature of I want. Now the problem is that usually the I want is connected to the world. So it's of the nature of I want the world. I want the world. And if you know a lot of Vedanta, if you know that I am Brahman and all that, immediately at the beginning at least, it will not make a difference to that I want the world. I want the world will continue as it is. So you will have this peculiar situation of, of, a, of a jnani who, is, uh, who may lose his temper, who may be greedy, who may be critical, who may be uh, uh, irritable, uh, who may be still in some sense worldly. What a peculiar situation, at least at the beginning. Whereas bhakti, look at the nature of bhakti. What's the nature of bhakti? Bhakti means love. So nature of love is I want. Desire of the world is of the nature of I want. And the nature of love is also I want. The difference is this. I want the world. The world is replaced with God. I love things of the world. That I love remains the same. That things of the world are replaced with God. Bhakti does that. Bhakti works at the level of the heart. Bhakti works, love works at the level of the heart. Love works in the heart. Knowledge works in the intellect. Knowledge is good for removing ignorance in the intellect. But love of God is good for removing the, the, the passions and the base desires which flow towards the world. The same things are turned towards God. Once somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna, how do I overcome lust? And Sri Ramakrishna said, why would you want to overcome lust? Turn it towards God. Turn it towards God. It's the same power which flows towards the world. It is channeled towards God. Yeah, that is the power of bhakti. Bhakti, therefore, brings qualifications for spiritual life in its own wake. That's why they say, in the path of knowledge also, they say, the teachers will always recommend that a good deal of bhakti is very good for a person walking on the path of knowledge also. So love of God brings with itself, you see, discrimination, you don't have to do that. Brahman is real, world is unreal, you have to, with a, with a pinched face thinking, oh, Brahman is real and this is unreal. You don't have to do that. Well, once the love of God is there, automatically you flow towards God and turn away from worldliness. Love will take you there. The discrimination comes by itself. Dispassion, oh, I must reject the world. You see, the problem with dispassion is this. The problem with trying to be detached from the world is this. Inside there is a desire. And again, also there is, a, there is this practice of trying to give up the desire. So the result becomes, I want, this is one side, and I don't want. And then you get a conflict. Whereas bhakti resolves it so beautifully, I want God. It flows that way. So automatically, this passion for the world is, uh, is taken for granted. It just comes by itself. It's very natural. This passion for the world comes by itself. Bhakti. Vairagya, the, the disciplines, calmness of the mind, control of the senses, automatic in love of God. When we have love of God, when you love somebody, uh, see, the mind automatically settles down on what you love, the person you love, the thing you love, the mind naturally settles down there. Control of the senses, all the senses are now engaged towards the service of the Lord. You don't have to physically, uh, you know, with a lot of discipline, try to control, control your life automatically, in a very smooth way, it flows towards God. So all the qualifications required in the path of knowledge come of themselves to the person who loves God. How do you love God? And the question is, how do you do that? It, it is easy to eat food, but not so easy to become hungry. If somebody says, eat it, you say, okay, I can eat it. But if somebody says, be hungry. Now, that's not really un under our control. So, it's, love God is a bit like that. It's like trying to tell a person, be hungry. Now, how do I love God? Suppose there is no love of God in my heart. Then how do I love God? It's actually quite simple. 
we have the power to love all of us we have the power to love we love so many things in the world we have affection for desire for desire is another form of love it's just we want so many things in the world now the teachers of bhakti the teachers of the love of god tell us very simple you have a list of things which you consider to be nice to be your own my father my mother my uh, husband my wife my child my friend and all the things which you like and which you want to be related to in that list in that list alone just add god to it one more in hindi they say mamata mindness who is mine in that mind list of mine add one more thing my god that's the beginning of love of god just just like that you feel my child also feel my god saint teresa uh, of uh, avila this is a beautiful thing you know she would always uh, um uh, call herself teresa of T teresa of uh, jesus so there's this beautiful story of a vision she had of a man in a white robe and obviously jesus christ Uh, with the beard and everything and appearing glowing figure appearing before her before she could say anything that man said to that vision that apparition said to her who are you and she said as she always did she blurted out i'm teresa of jesus who are you and that vision said i'm jesus of teresa uh, you see how touching that is the moment you add god my god and god also says my love you are my own child so that's the beginning of bhakti you add it to that there's a funny thing they say in uh, india it's called there's a sanskrit term for it bhikshu pada prasarana nyaya what happens if you add god to your life just you don't have to give up anything in, in at all in the world just add it to the list what happens so there's a there are these wandering beggars in india there are holy men holy beggars who wander around in india they'll come and ask for something at your house now there's a there's a funny story about them that if you if such a holy man comes to your house and says i don't need anything just give me a corner in your in your you have a big house give me a corner in your house i just just need that little corner now you forewarn if you do give a corner you know what will happen next that person and say just i need a little more space to space to stretch out my legs so sp stretching out the legs that's what's called the uh, bhikshu pada prasarana nyaya the holy beggar stretching out his legs so <laughs> what happens is next he will say i have this little image of krishna it has to be worshiped of course in not in the corner where i stay it in i need another corner so another corner immediately the image is installed and of course i need the flowers from your garden for the worship of the lord and the lord has to be given food offered food so in your kitchen i will do the cooking but not everywhere one spot in your kitchen must be reserved for the cooking for the lord and slowly before you know it the holy beggar and his little lord have taken over your life now it's a blessing that's what bhakti does if you allow god into your life like the camel putting its nose in the tent the proverbial story so slowly it spreads over your life and it is so sweet so charming it slowly engrosses your time your energy your hours of life everything becomes your thoughts your feelings become centered around god bhikshu pada prasarana nyaya it's a very very nice way of putting it the holy beggar spread um, you know stretching his legs your life gets covered by it how you get love of god you see they say here is one, one thing but one there are so many secrets of love here is one one is when we have intensely sublime feelings intense feelings of you singing hari rama hari krishna 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 hari hari you sing and dance or you listen to a very um, uplifting work of music may not be spiritual music you have a you see something wonderful sublime in nature a beautiful sunset maybe in the central park here heart is uplifted when deep uplifting emotions are there in your heart they say the heart the language used is the heart melts for a while now the secret is this when the heart melts for a while it may be in great joy it may be in sorrow 
It may be in sorrow also. The heart melts for a while. At that point, whatever you stamp into it will remain deeply in, uh, engraved in it. When the copper melts, that's when they put a, the, the engraving, they stamp it. The mold is put at that time. So it takes that shape. In the moments of intense emotion, when there are tears in your eyes, for whatever reason, if you stamp the name of the Lord, the form of the Lord, my Krishna, my Rama, my Gopala, I am thine, thou art mine. In that moment of intense emotion, it will go deep into your heart. Do you see what I mean? When the heart melts in emotion, at that point, stamp the name of the Lord, stamp the form of the Lord. If you have a mantra, stamp the mantra of the Lord in your heart at that point. It will stay. It will take root and do it as often as you can. You will see very soon. You say, I have no real love of God. I don't have bhakti. How to get bhakti? Very soon you will have a genuine, undeniable love of God in your heart. You will get it. That comes. This love of God is not just a feeling. This feeling is expressed. Always genuine love will be expressed. I love such and such person. Oh, what do you do? I don't do anything. I just love. Not very useful. That kind of love is not very genuine either. Love, bhakti is always expressed in service, in doing things for the person you love. Whatever you love, you would like to do something. If it's a person, if it's a cause, whatever it is, God, you do something. So love, bhakti is expressed in seva. In fact, in Sanskrit, the root for bhakti, bhaj, dhatu, the root in Sanskrit grammar, one of the meanings of that root for bhakti is bhaj sevayam. Bhaj also means to seva, to do seva. So to love should always be expressed in doing something. And the more you do, here's the secret, the more you do something for the Lord, the more you love the Lord. Tell me this, who loves more? The parents who do everything for the child or the child who has done or gets everything done for him or her. Who loves more? Does the, do the children love the parents more or the parents love the children more? The parents love the children more, without any doubt. The children are often the most selfish little creatures there are. <laughs> no, they have to be at a certain age and they, they need love. So the parents give love. Parents love the children more. Why? You know, one reason is because they do more for the child. The more you do, more seva you do for the Lord, the more you do for the Lord, more your bhakti will increase. This is another way of getting bhakti for the Lord. Seva. Not only seva for the Lord, not only doing things for the Lord, but actually you will see converting every action as an action of love. When you eat, whether you walk, whether you talk, whether you sleep, connect all those things with the beloved. So, Swami Vivekananda says, never approach anything except as God. When you eat, imagine you're not feeding yourself. You are feeding the Lord within. The, maybe the child Krishna is within, within you're feeding. I am not eating. When you're listening to beautiful music, imagine you're pouring that music at the feet of the Lord within. Powerful spiritual practice. When you are walking, imagine you're walking to the temple of the Lord. When you are sleeping, imagine you are meditating on the Lord or you are going to sleep in the lap of the Divine Mother. All the activities that we do, as long as they are moral activities, I know as long as they are not terribly bad, all the activities that we do can be connected to God. To so connect all your activities to God, that is another powerful way. Immediately, you see one of the important things about Bhakti is it immediately gives result, straight away. If you want to be happy, said somebody, if you want to be happy, fall in love, fall in love with God. There's a deep connection between happiness and love. In this country, and more so all over the West, and increasingly so all over the world, including India and everywhere else, the goal of happiness, the, the ideal of happiness seems to be this ideal of romantic love. That I'll find somebody to love who will love me back and hence I will be happy. Mostly it ends in disappointment and frustration and irritation. But there is a deep truth in that. It's not all wrong. 
it is true. Only thing is, it succeeds only if you relate that love to the divine. Fall in love with the divine, you will be happy, permanently so, you will never be disappointed. What is the result of such bhakti? There is in the Naradiya Bhakti Sutra, there is this. Um, it says, Siddho Bhavati, Amrito Bhavati, Tripto Bhavati. One becomes spiritually perfect, one becomes immortal, one becomes completely satisfied in life. Think about it. Spiritual perfection requires spiritual sadhana. Siddha, the Sanskrit word Siddhi requires sadhana. From sadhana comes Siddhi. From spiritual practice comes spiritual perfection. In bhakti, love is itself his own spiritual practice. Without any other spiritual practice, you get perfection. Amrita, immortal. How does one become immortal? Tameva viritva ati mrityu meti. The Upanishad says, by realizing Brahman, one goes beyond death. One becomes immortal. Amrito bhavati. One becomes immortal by the knowledge of Brahman. But here, by bhakti, by love of God, one gets that knowledge automatically without doing all that, you know, the Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, the Vedantic study of the Upanishads and then the reasoning about it, getting the conviction and then Vedantic meditation until you get Brahma Jnana, the illumination, the, the moment of uh, illumination which comes, Brahma Jnana, instead of all of that, put all of it aside. Just love God. Sri Ramakrishna says, my mother, Ma Kali, Ma chen ved Vedanta ache. The Divine Mother has shown me what is there in Veda and Vedanta. Sri Krishna says again and again in the Gita, those who love me, those who take refuge in me, I shall give them jnana. I shall give them that Brahma jnana. You will get that Brahma jnana from the Lord himself. The moment you get that Brahma jnana, Amrito Bhavanti, you become immortal. Immortality is gained thereby. Sri Krishna says, Daivi Esha Gunamai Mama Maya Duratyaya. My Maya, this samsara, very difficult to cross over. Made of the three gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas. This divine maya of mine is very difficult to cross over. How do you cross over? The jnani will say, well, we need to study the Upanishads and realize that I am the Atman and all the objections will come and we have to do a lot of reasoning and attend, attend lots and lots of Vedanta classes without falling asleep and take plenty of notes and, uh, and then argue and argue and argue and then once you have got some kind of understanding, meditate on that understanding, Vedantic meditation, nididhyasana, and finally, maybe, already you feel exhausted listening to all of that. Yeah. Maybe we will get that. But what does Sri Krishna say? How will you cross over Maya? Maameva ye prapadyante Maya metam tarantite Those who take refuge in me, those who love me, they alone shall cross Maya. Fall in love with God, God will take you across Maya. Sri Ramakrishna says, there is this, instead of paddling across the ocean of, of life on a little raft, tie your boat to the cruise ship. These huge cruise ships are there. Cruise ship is the avatar, is, is the Lord. The Lord will pull you across the ocean of life. Amrito bhavanti, you become immortal. The result of jnana you get by bhakti. Tripto bhavati, becomes completely satisfied. You see, what do we do to get satisfaction? We try to enjoy things in the world. Good food, good music, good company, relationships, power, money, success, vacations, the latest iPhone, what not. Enjoyments in the world. For all for what? All for satisfaction. A little tripti, the word used in Sanskrit, tripti of the heart. Does it work? Not really. It doesn't. Nobody yet has been able to claim that I have got permanent lasting satisfaction by things of the world. Nobody, not one person. Temporarily, yes. Momentarily, yes. But permanently, after a day, after a week, after a month, after a year, after 10 years, no. No. Nobody. But by bhakti, tripto bhavati. When the love of God comes into your heart, complete satisfaction. Lasting joy. Permanent joy. Tulsi Das says, the gopis, it's either Tulsi Das or somebody else, maybe Tulsi Das. Those who love God, like the gopis of Krishna, 
their heart cries out when they miss the Lord. When Krishna is not there, the Sanskrit word is viraha, the divine uh, sorrowing after the Lord. That divine sorrow, he says, all the joys of the world, all the joys of the world taken together, do not give an, even a speck of the happiness that that sorrow for the Lord gives. The tears you shed when you, not when you get the Lord, when you miss the Lord, when you do not find the Lord, the happiness you get from that is much more than all the joys of the world together. Tripto Bhavati. Without any other sadhana, Siddho Bhavati. Without trying directly for jnana, Amrito Bhavati becomes immortal. Without trying to enjoy the things of the world, complete satisfaction, Tripto Bhavati. All by what? By Bhakti. By love of God. Love is a many splendored thing, they say. There's a saying. What are the splendors of love? Akshaya. There is says Akshaya. Love does not decay. You know, even human love, even when the lovers died, love is suppo supposed to be immortal. Um, the Taj in, in India, the um, Taj Mahal, it's a symbol of human love. The emperor for his beloved queen. He made the Taj. Rabindranath Tagore puts it so beautifully, so evocatively. Everything passes away in time. Everything passes away in time. But the Taj, he says, it's a teardrop on the face of eternity. How beautifully put. The Taj is a teardrop in the face of eternity. Love is immortal. One of Kabir Das's beautiful uh, bhajans, Translated again so, so nicely by Rabindranath Tagore himself. He says, from the beginning of time till the end of time, there is such love between me and thee. How could such love ever be extinguished? So my Lord, so thou art my Lord, I am thy servant. Thou art my Lord, I am thy servant. How could such love be extinguished? Akshayishnu, it never diminishes. It never ends. Samadhi, in the path of meditation, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you know what is it meant for? It is meant for separating Purusha and Prakriti. Once the Purusha realizes itself apart from, my, from Prakriti, in its own splendor, after enlightenment, do you need Nirvikalpa Samadhi? No. Nirvikalpa Samadhi, even the highest Samadhi is necessary up to enlightenment. Once you get that, get that knowledge, get that freedom, not necessary. Does God need Nirvikalpa Samadhi? No, no, no. Jnana, the path of knowledge. When you, when you uh, study the Vedanta, when you hear the truth, Shravana, when you, when you cogitate upon that, when you reason it out and see how I am not the body and not the mind, finally you meditate upon it, Nididhyasana, and you get what is technically called Brahmakara Vritti, the the moment of cognition, the flash of illumination. I am Brahman. It happens. After that, after that I am Brahman moment of realization, do you need to hold on to that? No. Does Brahman need to hold on to Brahma Jnana? No. Sri Ramakrishna says, the thorn of ignorance is in your flesh. Take the, take the thorn of knowledge and remove the thorn of ignorance. Will you keep the thorn of knowledge in your flesh? No. Throw it out. Even Brahma Jnana is not required after moksha is attained. But love, bhakti, will you ever say, Oh, I love my beloved. Now that I have my beloved, I'll stop loving. How silly. Before you get God, you will love God. Once you get God, you will love God even more. Akshayishnu, it never decays, it never dies, eternal. That's why the lovers of God say, we do not want moksha, liberation. We just want love of God. Life after life, let me just love God, nothing else do I want. Akshayishnu. Then it says, sneha, another splendor of love. Always there is a glow of love, the warmth of love in your heart. There is not the serene aloofness of the yogi meditating in a cave. No. There is the glow of love within you. There is not the detachment of the jnani, of the path of, of uh, knowledge. I am not the body, not the mind, not the world. Well, you be that. Madhusudan Saraswati, the greatest of the jnanis, 
one of the greatest of the Advaitins, non-dualists in India, he wrote this, his magnum opus, Advaita Siddhi, one of the most difficult books ever written in any language anywhere in the world, establishment of non-duality, that same Madhusudan Saraswati says in his commentary on the Gita in one touching place, very beautiful place, he says, if the yogis want to retire to the caves and meditate in the darkness of the caves upon the light in their hearts, let them do so. For me, it is enough to see the little blue boy playing on the banks of the Yamuna. That's all I want to see. Who says this? Madhusudan Saraswati. There is a saying that um, Bodhat Prak Dvaitam Mohaya Before illumination, before realization, duality can put you in, in delusion. It can put you in samsara. This, this world of ours. Prapte Manishaya, once you get enlightenment, I am Brahman, in the path of knowledge. Bhakti Artham Kalpitam Dvaitam Madvaita Adapi Sundaram. The duality conceived for the sake of love is more beautiful than non-duality. Once you realize the non-dual truth that I am Brahman, all this is the divine. After that, then again you conceive of a difference between yourself and the Lord. And the, why do you do that? For loving. For love. And that love conceived for the sake of love, that duality is more beautiful than non-duality. So before enlightenment, duality puts you in samsara. After enlightenment, the duality conceived for bhakti, for love, is more beautiful than non-duality. Bhakti attam kalpitam dvaitam. The imagined, conceived duality. Advaita adapi sundaram, more beautiful than non-duality. So that love, that glow of love is always there in your heart. It's not an aloof intellectual kind of engagement, nor a complete detachment cutting off, of shutting down the body and the mind. And No, everything is active. Nitya nutana, another splendor of love. It is ever new. It never gets boring. All other things may become boring. Many people say, I worship Swami, I do the puja, but it becomes mechanical after some time. It does. It does. It's a kind of activity. If there is no love in it, it will become mechanical. I repeat the mantra, Swami, I'm supposed to repeat it. Without love, if you repeat the mantra, it will become dull and boring. I try to meditate, Swami, close my eyes and withdraw into the world. Mind keeps going out here and there. Mind keeps running around here and there. It will. It will. Because the mind finds it dull. You're trying to snuff out the mind inside yourself. It finds it dull. Why should it? It's like a naughty little kid. It wants to run about. Oh. But love, it's never boring. It's never dull. Nobody, in, in fact, even in human love, the boy and girl who fall in love with each other, they find it the most happy and exciting time of their lives. They don't say that, oh, I'm, I am so much in love. How dull and boring it is. Nobody says it's so ridiculous. Nobody ever heard of such a thing. Nitya Nutana. Always new. Love is always new. In love, there they say, uh, another splendor of love is Vakrata. Vakrata means, difficult to translate into English. It means a little twist. A little what you might call spice. The path of knowledge is very straight. The path of uh, of, uh, of meditation very straight. All other paths are very straight. You go to God. You go to enlightenment, meditation, whatever. But in the path of love, there is a spice. There is a twist. Uh, let me give examples you will understand. Once uh, Rakhal, Swami Brahmananda, he, he was, Sri Ramakrishna considered him his spiritual child. And so Rakhal was 18 or 19 years at that time would behave like a child of 5 or 6 years with, with Sri Ramakrishna. And uh, one day he said, I'm hungry. And Sri Ramakrishna looked around in his room. No food was there. So Sri Ramakrishna went. He was also like a child. He went to the bank of the Ganges and he shouted, Oh, Gaurdasi, Gopalar Madhya, the mother of Gopala, the, one, the, the lady who would, the widow who would see visions of the child Krishna, baby Krishna all the time. Oh, mother of Gopala, Gopalar Ma, Gaurdasi, come, my Rakhal is hungry. Come and bring food to the river. He shouted out to the river. And came back, quite satisfied. Within a short time, a boat came across the river with Balaram Babu and um, Gopalirma. And they had got Rasogulla, the, the sweet cheese balls, uh, 
soaked in syrup and they came amazingly they came amazing coincidence or was it i don't know and then sri ramakrishna calls out to rakhal oh come come uh, the, this food has come and uh, he says to the others look my rakhal is hungry so he has the food come and eat now rakhal is annoyed he said yeah i'm hungry but you have to shout and tell everybody that i'm i'm hungry and Sri Ramakrishna says, what's wrong in it? You are hungry. So I told people that you are hungry. There's nothing wrong in it. This is, this humor, this little teasing, this little annoyance is always there in any kind of love. You will find a little bit of uh, annoyance is there, a little bit of quarrel, lovers, tips are there, a little bit of teasing is there. Vakrata, little, that, that is the, uh, that is the sweetness. There's a lot of sweetness involved in that. Mm, there are lots of ups and downs. Vakrata, Abhaya, another splendor of love, fearlessness, in love there is fearlessness. The moment you come to Bhakti, the religion of awe becomes the religion of love. Haven't you seen in a house, big, fierce dog, which outsiders are scared of, but the baby of the house who can barely walk, a toddler, can punch the dog, can climb on the shoulders of the dog, and the dog just plays with the baby and licks the baby and doesn't do anything else, just protects the baby. In the same way, a similar story is uh, the Nisringa avatar, the most terrible of the incarnations of God, who was uh, who who came forth to protect the boy, Pralada, from the demon Hiranyakashipu, who was an atheist and who hated God, and Pralada was his son, the demon's son who loved God and of course Hirnakashipu could not bear it and uh, one day the demon who was an emperor of demons, Rakshasas, he said, uh, where is this God of yours? And the little Prahlada said, everywhere. Is he in that pillar? Yes, he is in that pillar. And Hirnakashipu, this is a story which every Indian child knows, he kicks that pillar and from the pillar comes out this terrible form of half man, half lion. And there's a story behind that. Why does it have to be half man, half lion? And all those things are there. Long story. And then kills the demon. But it's so, so terrifying that everybody is terrified of this incarnation. How to calm down God. God in his wrathful form. They said, put the little child uh, Prahlad on the lap of this fierce um, emanation of God. And when they do that, they immediately, the Nrsing Avatara calms down when he looks with eyes of love upon the little child sitting on his lap. So love it leads to fearlessness, abhaya. I think I've told this story earlier, but I, I, this is the right time to tell the story again. This thing about, like many mythologies, are acted out in India in, uh, in drama, in, in theater. Uh, so one of the well-known theaters is Pralada, the, st the story of Pralada. And in the climax of the, of the play is when the, the uh, demon Hiranyakashipu kicks the pillar and the Lord comes out in this terrible form. And you can imagine, a lot of special effects are involved. The, some, the actor is dressed up with a, with a mask of a, of a lion and all those things. And now, and it's, this is a real thing, it actually happened. There's a little bunch of little kids who were performing that play. And when it came to the climax, there are these, it's a royal palace, two pillars have been set up behind one of the pillars and the audience can see everything. Behind one of the pillars is this half man, half lion hiding there and waiting for the pillar to be kicked down. And the little boy who is Pralada and the demon Hiranyakashipu who is another little boy, maybe a little bigger. Where is this god of yours? And the little boy Pralada says, he's everywhere. Is he behind this pillar? Now the boy knew the actor who is playing Nrsinga is hiding behind the other pillar. So he said, no, he's behind that pillar. <laughs> Which is really deals a heavy blow to the omnipresence of the Lord. <laughs> so it was very smart of the kid because he was afraid the whole thing was going to flop if this demon goes and kicks down this pillar and nobody comes out of it. Um, fearlessness is, is one aspect of, of love. Another aspect of love is, um, they say, dosha leads to seva. What it means is this, if you find a defect in the beloved, if you really love, then your reaction will be to put it right, to serve, to protect, not to discard. It's like you buy something in the, 
uh, in the shop uh, maybe a toy or a gadget and it doesn't work too well you return it and you get a replacement but suppose a child is born to somebody and a child has a defect or maybe a, 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 a physically challenged or mentally challenged something like that now will the mother say I'll, I want to give this baby up and get another baby no never because of love you'll often see mothers are specially protective of children with special needs are more protective more fiercely protective when um, Sri Ramakrishna became ill with cancer throat cancer there were people who abandoned him who thought that what kind of a saint is he he gets uh, disease or cancer so it's not, not nothing very great they walk up and Sri Ramakrishna pointed out there is a meaning to this why I have got this he used the term antaranga those who are the inner circle of devotees they'll be separated from the, the rest those who have come for something else those who really do not love God for the sake of God they will walk away they will lose interest those who really love God they will come closer this will pull them closer and so the inner circle of devotees both householder devotees and those who became monks later on they all started serving Sri Ramakrishna and he bound them together in the bond of love so any defect any problem if you really love you move forward to protect to remedy the situation to serve in the Dakshineshwar temple when the priest by accident slipped and fell and the image of Krishna was damaged they were thinking should we replace the image of Krishna get a new image of Krishna Sri Ramakrishna said uh, that no he said to somebody if your son-in-law breaks a leg will you replace your son-in-law <laughs> you will treat him then uh, he took the image gave me the image and he repaired the image he beautiful so beautifully repaired it that nobody could see the break the break the damage any problem leads to more love to service to to the, the desire to protect and take care of that's the sign of love not discarding not giving up in that case that's not love and another one they say it's beautifully put in Hindi Prem Deri Duri or Parda Mita Deta hai. what it means is love wipes out distance time and how do you put Parda the, the, the gap between the lover and the beloved you see in, in the other paths I am meditating I am um, uh, pursuing the path of knowledge maybe in this life or maybe in the next life I'll finally get enlightenment who knows when it will come lot of distance in time now and then uh, duty distance something I am walking in a pilgrimage towards say um, Jerusalem or Vrindavan or Kashi long distance away but in love the presence of the beloved is always felt within because you are always dwelling in the thought of the beloved the distance of time uh, of space is erased by love and Parda that means that the gap the barrier is removed in love in the path of love there is a peculiar intimacy which is not there in other paths there's a peculiar intimacy between you and the beloved between you and God which is not there in other paths the difference is this somebody came to meet the king and the, of course the gatekeeper said stop where are you going oh let me go I know the king I'm going to meet the king the gatekeeper said that's not the point whether you know the king or not a lot of people know the king does the king know you the lover of God can claim I love my Lord and my Lord loves me and all gates are open they say the inner inner the under mahal that means the uh, inner chambers of the royal palace which no outsider is allowed to enter only the lover of God is allowed to enter that the, the, the uh, love bhakti brings you very close to God many splendid thing akshaya undecaying um, nutana ever new Sneha, the, always the glow of love is present. It colors all your life. Uh, then um, then uh, Abhaya, fearlessness is there. In love there is no fear, no awe. Vakrata, there is a twist, a spice into love. There is the desire always to serve and protect and, and, and you know help. Not to get something but to give something. So dosha leads to seva. And finally intimacy the distance of time and space is erased by love these are the splendors of love 
The practices. There are some very powerful practices. And those practices are also enjoyable. Another thing is, very interesting thing. Often the practices which lead up to success in meditation or in the path of knowledge, the practices themselves are not particularly enjoyable. They're like taking bitter medicine. You must practice yama, niyama, uh, the, the disciplines of, of, of the moral disciplines. You, you must be completely truthful. You must be uh, self-controlled. You must be non-violent. You must not accept gifts. You must not be beholden to anybody else. You must not take things which are not yours. The, the yamas, the niyamas, the fivefold moral disciplines, do's and don'ts. Then only it starts. And then you sit still. You can't jump around and move around. You have to sit still absolutely. Control your breath. Withdraw from the world. Concentrate inside. All of them at each stage, pretty difficult. Pretty difficult. Those who have tried it, they know it. Whereas in the path of love, all of the practices are very sweet. They, they are themselves, in themselves, enjoyable. Um, I'll tell you a few of them. I'll tell you five of them now. Powerful practices. One practice is the name. The name of God. Many of uh, many of us, we have got the mantra from the Guru. So this is very relevant. The name of God. There's a beautiful story about this. At the start of creation of the universe, at the start of the creation, when the universe was created, there was a division of property between God and man. Naranarayan. There's a division. What is mine and what's yours? And God said unto man, my form will remain hidden. I take my form. You will not be able to see me. But my name I give unto you. For the billions of years of samsara, which you will go through many lives, many births and deaths in, in, in this samsara, one thing will keep you company is my name. But not my farm. You can't see me. So the farm is withdrawn, but the name is with us. The name is an extremely powerful way of reaching the Lord. The name of God. Whether you chant it, whether you sing it, whether you may, uh, repeat a mantra with the name of the Lord, whether you meditate upon it, uh, the name of the Lord is extremely powerful because there is a doctrine, Nam Nami Abheda. The name and the named are one and the same. They are non-different. Call one, the other will come. Just like somebody calls your name and you immediately respond, Yes, what? Did you call me? God responds to the name. Swami Tapasyanji used to say, I read in one place that when you take initiation, Mantra Diksha, God is given to you. You don't know it. It's in seed form. The mantra itself is the Lord. The Lord is hidden there. And the Lord will manifest himself when you repeat that name. So the name of God, extremely powerful. There are many, many things to be said about it. And there could be a whole lecture series on the name of God alone. One thing. There is something called Nama Aparada, an offense against the name of God. It's in Vaishnava theology, they say. What is the offense against the name of God? To consider anything else, any other technique, any other practice as equal to or superior than the name of the God, of, of the Lord. The mantra you have been given by the Guru is the supreme method of God, uh, God realization. It is the closest to God, the name of the Lord. Everything else, this technique of meditation, this kind of puja, that kind of um, philosophy, all of them are subordinate. They are good. They are all supportive. Many people think that the name of the Lord is a simple thing. It's meant for simple-minded people. For me, it's the high philosophy of Vedanta, Nama Parada. It's an offense against the name of God. So there are these different offenses. Uh, there is offense against the, the form of the, of the deity. The picture of the, of the form of, of God in a temple, you'll find different conceptions of the form of God. What is the, the offense? Um, different kinds of offense are there. Suppose, the, you know, in a temple, you misbehave. You lose your temper on somebody else in front of the deity. You wouldn't do that. Imagine a, a VIP present in your, in your house, the most important person in your life, maybe... Um, the king of the country or, or the, 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 your guru or somebody is present, would you misbehave in the, in the presence of the guru? No, you'd be so careful. In the presence of the deity, we think it's a picture, it's an image, it doesn't matter. We hardly pay any attention. That's offense against the form of God. Somebody 
that's why I, I feel uneasy if somebody bows down to me there. It's one of the offenses against the form of God to accept pranams in the presence of, of God. You should neither offer nor accept pranams in the presence of God. Another thing is, the way we sit should not put your legs towards the deity. So there are different, these, these many things are there, many things to learn, very nice. Uh, but how do you overcome that? By meditating on the form of the Lord. So that offense against form is overcome in this way. There's an offense against the devotee of God, a lover of God. If you offend the lover of God, you see, an offense against the name of God is overcome if you repeat the name of God. An offense against the form of God is overcome if you meditate on, with reverence on the form of the uh, on the form of the Lord. But an offense against the devotee cannot be overcome like that. The Lord cannot forgive that. You have to seek forgiveness from the devotee. It's, the, it's a beautiful thing that if you offend a devotee, somebody who loves God, you must seek forgiveness from that person. Otherwise, the Lord will not forgive. And so on. So these are, this is the name of God. That's the first one. The second one is, of course, the form of the Lord. You might say the form is hidden. You just said, Swami, the form is hidden. Yes, it is hidden. But we have representations. Um, enlightened people have experienced God in different forms. And the artist's conception. And in this case, we have actually a photograph. We consider Sri Ramakrishna to be an avatar. So this is the first time we actually have a, have a picture, a photograph of an avatar. So this is a form of the Lord. The form is extremely powerful. The Holy Mother says, Somebody said, I cannot meditate, Mother. If you cannot meditate, it is enough to look at the picture of Sri Ramakrishna. She says very, very clearly, it is enough if you sit and look at the picture of Sri Ramakrishna. Just keep looking, calmly, quietly. That's enough. That is as good as meditation. There is a beautiful story which I want to narrate here. Ramanujacharya, the great teacher of Vishishtadvaita, qualified monism, Vishishtadvaita Vedanta, who lived about a thousand years ago in the south of India. This happens in the state of what is now Tamil Nadu, in Sri Rangam. Ramanuja Acharya at that time was a very well-known teacher. He lived to be 120. So <laughs> but this time he was pretty old and he was, he was well-known by that time as a great teacher. And there was this great festival in the temple of Vishnu, Sri Rangam temple. And... Uh, if you have seen some of the big festivals in the south of India, uh, what happens is thousands of people gather, there's a chanting of the Vedic hymns, and people wave these lamps and offer coconuts and things like that. And then there are, the main image cannot be taken out. The main image is huge. It's inside the temple. But there are what is called Utsava Murti, uh, little images which are taken out in procession and taken around the temple accompanied by music and chanting and all that sometimes taken around the town if it's a small temple town so this is all going on and thousands of people are all around and Ramanuja is passing through the crowd they are surrounded by disciples suddenly they see a small commotion at one part of the crowd they see this one young man powerfully built um, he's holding an umbrella so they had umbrellas in those days but they were big bamboo kind of uh, umbrellas holding this umbrella over the head of a young girl and staring at that girl continuously. And people all around look a little disgusted at this kind of behavior. It's a religious, a spiritual festival. And this boy is standing looking at this girl. Now Ramanuja sees this and tells one of his disciples, call that young man. And the disciples are embarrassed. This, the, this should happen in front of Ramanuja Acharya. Anyway, they go and say to that young man who is holding the umbrella, Please come and meet our master. Ramanuja Acharya wants to speak with you. And their, their expression is probably, I don't know why the master wants to speak with this guy. He's good for nothing, obviously. So the young man says, okay. And he puts the umbrella down and he goes to Ramanuja and bows down. And Ramanuja says, who are you? And why were you staring at that girl? And he says, I am Dhanur Dasa. He is a wrestler. And he says, uh, that the, name, the name of the girl is Hemamba. So I'm looking at her because she has the most beautiful pair of eyes in the universe. That's why I'm staring at her. And everybody around it, they go, they go red in the face. And they think, what a shameless guy think, saying this, all these, these things in front of such a holy pers personage. But Ramanuja is unfazed. He says, if I show you a more beautiful pair of eyes, will, would you like to see? He says, of course. All right. Today in the evening, 
when the arati, the evening vespers are performed in Ranganatha Swami in the temple inside, you come deep into the temple, the Garbhagriya, the inner sanctum. Well, I will be there. You come. Will they let me in? Tell them I call, I said so to let you in. He said, okay, I'll come. And then you know, today, today's language, he would have said, cool. I'll come. That's cool. And he goes back to exactly what he was doing. Picks up the umbrella and starts staring at that girl. And other people, they're, they're sort of shaking their heads and, you know. And the evening comes when Ramanuja is in the temple and that young man is led through and there's a big crowd and the Arati. Now the inner shrine is dark. In most traditional temples, it's dark. So the only light comes from the lamps, the oil lamps which are lit. And to the accompaniment of music, the priest waves the lamp. And what you do is, if it's a big image, you first, here also when we do Arati, you wave the lamp at the feet of the Lord, at the uh, chest of the Lord, in the face of, uh, illumining the face of the Lord. And there are a number of times when you do that. As the lamp light fell on the face of Vishnu, the image in, in the Sri Rangam temple, Ramanuja held the hand of that young man, Dhanurdasa, and said, look, the most beautiful pair of eyes in the universe. And Dhanurdasa looked and the image came alive for him. He looked upon the face of God. And Ramanujacharya went into Samadhi. Dhanurdasa went into Samadhi there. People looked stunned at these two, standing there completely lost in Samadhi. And Dhanurdasa later on became one of Ramanujas. And that girl also, whom he married, Hemamba and Dhanurdasa, both of them, they became some of Ramanujas' closest disciples. And there are beautiful stories about both of them. The form of the Lord. In the, I think, in the, um, this beautiful book on Bhakti and the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. You know, in, in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, there is a verse which is quoted to the effect that when you look upon the face of Hari illumined by the lamp of Arati in the evening, at the end of the day, when the darkness falls across the land, when the Arati lamp is lit, and in that light, when you look upon the face of God, the sins of a lifetime are washed away. So, the form of the Lord. Very powerful practice. Eyes are meant for seeing God. That's why we've got eyes. Then another practice. Vibhuti. Wherever you see anything glorious, wherever you see anything powerful, anything grand, connect it immediately to God. How wonderful Lord are, is thy creation. Let it remind you of God. It is a connection. Do you not see something that as we, we in the modern world, we lose faith in the existence of God? The receding sea of faith. Who said that, Elliot? The receding sea of faith. The sad, slow sound of the receding sea of faith. We are losing faith in the existence of God. But parallelly, do you see how nature has become important? It's like a parallel secular religion. Art, nature. We are trying to replace and we are failing. We are trying to re replace God and we are failing. They speak about a God-shaped hole in the psyche of humanity. We have taken out God and so there is a hole in our, our, our mindset and the hole is in the shape of God. And there is a f funny quip about the Buddhist, you know the void, those who say the ultimate reality is the void. The Buddhist replaces the God-shaped hole with a hole-shaped God. <laughs> the zero. <laughs> this is just a joke. So, nature. There is a connection between nature and God. That's why when we cannot, can no longer believe in God in this modern world, agnostic world, we grab for the next best thing which is nature. But you can have both. Use nature, use art, anything. Use anything in this world to connect you to the Lord. That's the 10th chapter of the Gita where all grand and good things are used to remind Arjuna. Uh, the sun and the moon, uh, the lights in the sky, they all remind you of the Lord. Sri Krishna says, I am everything, but in the grand and the beautiful and the good, you easily connect it to God. Um, so, as the poet sings, in the, the, the rays of the rising sun early in the morning, in the flowers in the creeper outside my window, 
in the smile of the baby reflected in the smile of the mother in all these things my lord thy love for me is, is shown so everything nice and beautiful sri ramakrishna says wherever you find something grand something powerful something magnificent remember that is a special expression of the power of god notice it immediately admire it connected to the lord mentally bow down my lord thou art here i bow down to thee so connect all that is good and beautiful in your life whatever you find with god another here we are coming very close back full circle to the path of jnana again the lord is existence consciousness bliss in everything that exists not only the grand and the good even in the mean and the small if it exists note the existence and bow down my lord you are here not the chair not the table but the existence the very being which the chair and the table share in your own inner being my lord you are here existence sat is a visible manifestation of brahman on this world whenever you have any experience all our life is just a collection of experiences you see you hear you smell you touch you think you remember all of these are conscious experiences each experience is different from the other good and bad what you want what you do not want uplifting and degrading in all the experiences one golden thread runs unbroken your own awareness consciousness without consciousness no experience consciousness is chit the pure consciousness that is manifested through all our experiences the golden thread connecting all of the thread connecting all the pearls in the necklace of our life that thread that consciousness is the lord in every experience that you have you can recognize the lord and bow down my lord it is by thy light that my my life is lit up tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam that shining the lord shining everything else shines here in the universe tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati by the light of that by the light of that divine everything here is lit up so that consciousness which you find in every experience we find in every experience of our lives we let us recognize that as god and bow down my lord you are present here in the deepest sorrows in the greatest happiness my lord you are present here that sorrow and that happiness could not have been manifested without consciousness and in joy ananda bliss every time you can have even the bliss of say eating a the joy of eating a cookie for to the 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 joy of watching the high, highest beautiful work of art to the joy of uh, of loving somebody who is close to you in life all of these joys a variety of multicolored multifaceted joys that make up the best part of our lives in all those joys recognize ananda lord the lord himself is present there as ananda as bliss sat chit ananda pure existence pure consciousness pure bliss in itself is god manifested through the existence of things in the universe through the experiences we have all experiences and through the the few scatterings of joys that that light up our lives all of that the lord is present there and i recognize sat chit ananda last one more before i end one more technique this one is little advanced in the gita it is said there are some who love me as the oneness in all beings ekatvam now this it is there now we don't see it we see 10000 waves we do not see the one water running running through all the waves we see the uh, golden ornaments and our eyes are attracted to that we do not see the one gold running in and through all of that there is a oneness to life which we are missing all the time it's there right now one why i said it is advanced it needs a little breakthrough somewhere it needs a little little intuition of that oneness if you feel it once you have felt god so that oneness which unites all of us swami vivekananda said the test of truth is if it unites you it is true if it divides you and sets you off against each other it is untrue it is false that oneness which unites all of us in which we are all grounded the ground of our being this the ground of my soul and the ground of god are one and the same thing that oneness the divine oneness that is the very definition of brahman so that oneness we love god as the oneness of all existence 
these are some of the powerful practices of bhakti we'll have more occasion to talk about this in the on uh, the next sunday where i shall talk about a variety of ways in which one can develop the love of god and one can love god and transform this life into a blessing i pray to sri ramakrishna i pray to the holy mother i pray to swami vivekananda to bless us with love of god with bhakti there is nothing more than what they want the, it is said the lord has come upon this world becomes an incarnation in order to teach love of god to 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 humanity so we want that and we want we pray to the lord fill our hearts with love of god may we love you in this life and in lives to come may we surrender unto you may the holy mother's blessings be on all of us present here today om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu